Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, my name is Annika Acker, and I made um, a lecture called Green Cities as Future Cities, and I deliberately took this picture because I think we have to um, turn our thoughts around sometimes with these challenges that our cities have these years. I'm just briefly, uh, I've structured my talk to just shortly say who am I? Who am I? Who I am? Copenhagen, a micro, micropolis. I'm sorry, it's a bit difficult for me to speak English, so sometimes I fumble a little or fumble a little or whatever you say, but bear with me. I'm very eager on this subject, so I have a lot to say in 10 minutes, and that's a challenge. And then I'll say four steps about what I consider is important. So, who am I? I am an environmental planner. I did a PhD in urban planning, and I sit today in a public administration department. So, I'm very keen on investigating how does it matter the way we design interactions when we are public authorities who wants to collaborate with citizens, the institutional design. Now you sit with the back to each other, could we do it more wisely, and so on and so on. I'm interested in uh, how we measure when we make such projects collaboratively, because as you said, the politicians need a vocabulary about what is the public value, should we use it for school books or participatory processes or for greening the pavement or whatever. So these are kind of, and, and uh, yeah, so I'm very much interested in this deliberative democracy, collaborative planning, co-production, interactive governance, and so on. So there are different uh, phrasings in the different uh, scholarly fields that frames the same differently about this. How do we maneuver between some who wants yes and some who wants no, and we have to make some solid plans across. Copenhagen, we are one million. Uh, in Denmark, we are five million in total. Uh, we call ourselves, but I, I noticed that <laughs> Dublin does it too. I guess every capital in Europe does it. They call themselves a laboratory. Because we are kind of small and we are testing a lot of things. I took deliberately this uh, picture because 15 years ago, oh no, yeah, we wouldn't have been able to take such a picture, but we took, but there was some visionary political uh, politicians and some visionary planners who said, why now that we have, you have a, you have a river in the middle of the city, but we have a, the ocean that goes in, and they said, we should have a, now that we have the ocean so close, it should be so clean so we could swim in it. So thank you for the uh, visionary politicians and so on. We have this uh, beautiful recre recre recreational site that we can swim in our harbor today, that my kids can do it, I couldn't do it when I was young. We also have, and this is a, a bit, now this is a planning program, and I'm talking a bit about the importance of planners being visionary too. This is a plan for Copenhagen called the Finger Plan that was made in 45 or something. And uh, there there were some visionary planners who said we should make some traffic uh, train structures al along the fingers so we can get green sites very close into the city. And then today this is our, our, the way we have structured the Copenhagen area. So I'm talking a bit, it's not very popular to make grand plans these years, but with this climate change and so on, we, we need grand plans, but compared to previous times, we need to make these plans in collaborations with politicians, citizens, scientists, and so on, all this collaboration. So um, that's what Copenhagen has done. They said, we want to be the best. <laughs> Every city wants to be the best in something. But they claim that they want to be the best bike city in the world. So they have done a lot of... Uh, so visions are sometimes good to have a common goal and then make little projects along the way. Uh, we have also this common goal that we want to be the best, the first capital in the world to be CO2 neutral. 
But what is good with this plan is that it obliges the, political, the politicians to make a commitment that then makes it okay for the different bureaucratic municipal departments to try to make options that go uh, in a way that fulfills these visions. We haven't come there yet, but we have the visions and plans. But as every other city in the world, we have had huge extreme weather phenomena. So even though that we have all our grand plans and so on, we experience the same uh, challenges as every other ones. This was the day before, actually. Uh, it was in 2015, I think. And uh, all the hospitals, they were almost, uh, they had to, uh, well, it was the day before my daughter was operated in her heart. So we were very worried if uh, the hospital, they, it was almost um, closed down. So it really challenged, it put something on the agenda. What do we do with this extreme weather phenomena? And as you said, with your fancy uh, uh, slide, can we, can we make this opportunity? We can be really sad about this climate change, but we can also view it as an opportunity that now we are going, we have to do something. We have to do something investing in infrastructure and how can we do it in a wise way that gives, an, gives us an extra asset. That's what you were talking about. And that's what I'm going to talk with my stupid English. There's nobody speaking Danish or Swedish in here, are there? No, no, sorry. So you have to start. You can. Oh, that's <laughs> only one word. Else you can help me when I can't find the words. But So what are the four steps that I consider is uh, really important? And maybe it's common sense, but I took this. What is really important in order to make green, resilient cities that are also inclusive and so on? I think it's really important that we provide this infrastructure that makes it so easy to make environmentally friendly choices. And one step is this, making good biking lanes. It's cheap and it's healthy and so on that we take the bikes up to 12 kilometers in Denmark at least, we, then we bike. That's the natural transportation form for us. But we are lucky, we also have really, really good bikes and our little kids, it's normal in the kindergarten that we learn them to bike, I think in Holland too. And in Sweden and Norway, it's, it's the, the most common uh, transportation thing. But it's also due to that we have really good biking lanes. Also this uh, metro system, it gives itself of course, but also I noticed when I came to the airport, Actually, there are some really good sorting divisions here in uh, Dublin, right? I guess much better than in uh, Denmark. But that's important that it's easy for us to make the right choice when we act around in our urban environment. Oops. Then the next step that I think is so important is how do we actually communicate? And how, what do we call our citizens? Because the way we are labeling them affects the way they perceive each, their roles. So are we calling them customers and then they expect that the, they, uh, that the city should do a lot for us? Or are we calling them citizens? Well, there's a division there in the Danish language that I can't translate. But I, I, I found it very inspirational that the technical and environmental department in Copenhagen they called it, I'll say it in Danish, sammen om byen. It says together, Copenhagen together. So in all their garbage uh, vans and in a lot of the municipal, um, in their clothes and so on, it says Copenhagen together. And what it signifies is that cleaning is not just a matter of the municipality, it's a matter of, of common things. It's a matter of... of uh, that you have an obligation to. This is some partnerships uh, that is done with the local uh, uh, shop, shops, in a way, local partnerships that says together about having a clean Copenhagen. And on each garbage site, it says, now I'll translate it, ren kærlighed til København, it says pure love to Copenhagen. 
It's nice. It's little signal. It's, it's yeah. Sorry, my English. But I, I really like that because it makes me feel that it's part of my city too. It's not that I'm expecting that it's only the city uh, employed people who has to clean. Then I think it's so important that in order to create this future city, green city and so on, we have to, we now, I educate public administrators, so when I say we, I talk as the municipality or planning department. We have to play with the planning approaches and actually you, Ali, talked a bit about that too, that a lot of the challenges we are facing are wicked problems that need integrated solutions. But what I find interesting in Copenhagen at least is that we see a lot of two waves coming into the planning department. One wave is anthropology and another wave is design thinking. I don't know if some of you have read or know Jan Gehl. Have you know the architect Jan Gehl? And he's very much about going out there, studying, instead of sitting behind the desk in the municipal planning department, then actually go out where people are, asking them and so on. And I have a little example of that. Uh, but the other thing is, as we talked about earlier, is design thinking about testing and uh, getting away from risk averse. That was the word. I didn't know the word, but not being so risk averse. Making a culture where it's more acceptable that we fail, we test, we try, and so on. And I think those two waves coming into planning is really interesting. And as you said, Elizabeth, in a way, it's really nice times. It's, we have a lot of challenges and so on, but a lot of interesting things is going on. And maybe it's a bit like your Hidden Rooms project, but this is a guy called Kenneth Belfeld. He's sitting there with a hand on the Mac. And he's, uh, he was hired by the municipality to go out and find out what could be clever solutions for homeless people and to make some areas where there were toilets and where they could, areas where they could uh, take their drugs. And so on very difficult issues, but these people would never, ever, ever, ever come to a public meeting. So you would have to go out where they were and you would have to uh, communicate cleverly. Uh, and they were taking, they were as eager as anyone else when they were met face, face to face calmly. And, uh, and they actually came up with some really great ideas. So yes, it costs time, it costs resources to uh, go out and uh, make these more face-to-face -face processes. They also tested, they did a lot of testing of scale and size and so on. So, future cities, green cities, they also have to be inclusive cities, democratic cities and so on. And if we want people to take part and care of their cities, of their areas, of their neighbors, then we also need to play with the way we communicate with each other. And this is a typical citizen meeting in Denmark. I guess, I don't know, if is it, would it be a typical meeting in Ireland too, or in Dublin? What do you notice up here? It's a Tuesday night from five to seven or six. What, what do you notice? A little bit older people, and uh, they look a little bit tired, and they sit with their uh, neck to each other. So we have to, to play with these meeting forms, especially when we are concerned that we also want to mobilize the young generations. So the municipality are playing. Have some all those who have been in Copenhagen raised their hands? Ah, that's nice. Then I guess you have been in here. That's the Latin Quarter. And that was a public meeting, a Saturday from 10 to, to 1. And the public meetings were placed in temporary spaces out in the street. I live just beside the Yellow House. And even though that I study uh, citizen participation, I'm the most, um, what do you call it, the donor, lazy citizens. But, and my, and my daughter who's sitting up there, she would never ever go to a meeting. But because the uh, meeting was on the street, 
and you, she was offered a cup of coffee too, and she could in 15 minutes sit with her urban planner. Then the urban planners, they collected so many opinions that day in compared to going, making this boring meeting as I showed you on the photos before. So we have, to, and as a teaching, as a school, educating planners, we also have to consider how do we make planning fun and how do we, what methods could we apply? Could we do a little bit, uh, could we turn it around a bit? And uh, so then shortly, it's a bit the same as you said. Uh, another way of playing with the formal ways we do things was that Copenhagen municipality, they saw they, uh, they knew they were going to use a lot of millions on climate, uh, what do you call, tiles in the ground and so on, boring things that should take all the water. And they also wanted to say, could we add a recre 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 recreational aspect to it? So they, as a new thing, made a think tank. So they invited 10 persons, I was one of them, luckily, a philosopher, a biologist, researchers, one studying nudging, uh, uh, all, kind, uh, all kind of really different people, and then uh, also the 10 leading from the technical departments. And we, we were going to say, okay, now that we are using so many, um, so many resources, how can we... Uh, do it in clever ways that adds value, but also that contributes to the urban nature. And it was funny that you uh, talked about the need of us as scholars providing politicians with a clever vocabulary about what comes out when we do different things. So we also try to invent a tool, and I couldn't get it in a, a big, uh, no, in a good, Spot, but I can give you the link if anybody are interested. But we, we made this with different dimensions. So every time when planners do a project, then they can talk about what dimensions are actually enhanced. And I guess all around the world, and that's good science, we're, we're doing this stuff right now at the moment because we need, we need good arguments to say, in this project, if you do this and that, then this will benefit that factor and so on and so on. So, uh, the last step, that's actually the step closest to my research and my heart, that's this about involving citizens. And uh, I have been reading, does anybody of you know a book called Investing in Democracy made by a city planner called Carmen Siriani from Seattle? Seattle, sorry. But he talks very much about this enabling dimension that is so important and maybe it's because I am from Scandinavia and we have <laughs> we pay so much in tax and we have high trust in government but at least in my hood we talk uh, it's often uh, the public authorities who starts up uh, collaborations they have this enabling function that make these platforms where different partners can co-produce clever solutions so I think that in order to play that role more cleverly, public authorities need to be more flexible in, for example, this is uh, five years ago, I don't think such a project would, uh, would, could be realized. This is a project where normally the uh, local authorities would say, no, you cannot borrow this vacant space because of all kinds of rules. But now this design thinking and this temporary uses of spaces are coming in more as a mode of operating. So here is a boring industrial area that for a month is a livable market space with a lot of grass. It's not very expensive for public authorities to roll out grass. And then there's a flea market and blah, blah, blah. But it's giving an expression about what can we use these vacant spaces for? And every city almost in Europe have boring vacant spaces that we can use and make some uh, activities in. Um, oh yeah, this is another project. It's called, and now I need your help, Adopt a Flower Bed 
Thank you. <laughs> and this is also, there's a municipal, the roads are municipal, as I don't know how it is here in Dublin. But then uh, they say, okay, you are allowed to have this little two meters in front of your house that you can, uh, if, you ca if you water the plants, and the plants are even paid for from the municipality, and maybe there even comes a gardener who says, you should do this and that and that. Uh, give, some, uh, give some help, but then it gives ownership so it's also this transferring uh, citizens from being consumers to being us. It's us, it's part of the city, and uh, giving a place, identity, and ownership. I'm sorry, you get what I mean. <laughs> Adopt a flower bit. And that's also new music within how the public authorities uh, operate. Then it's, I think it's also, I don't know, do you have a lot of urban gardens here in Dublin? Little community urban gardens? Yeah, big, more and more. And it's interesting because, for example, in Malmö, the southern of Sweden, that is very close to Copenhagen, there's a certain deprived areas called Rosengorn, and there's been a lot of riots and vandalism and so on. But what is always left without vandalism is the urban gardens. And the urban gardens is often considered to be a neutral place or a third place where people will meet and you are from Africa, I'm from Sweden, and you are from uh, Syria, whatever. And then they would stand talk about different plants and so on. So this is actually a urban, they call it an urban farm on top of a very uh, boring industrial place, but that recruits many volunteers. But Many of these projects are commenced by active citizens, but if the municipality doesn't help them a bit, and especially in times where the, at the beginning there would often be a lot of active citizens, but then maybe half a year after there would only be one or two. So we need as public authorities to bear in mind and support these active citizens. I'm almost done. This is a uh, bees that is also contributing so much to biodiversity. And these are a project with homeless men that for the first time have a role and have learned something and so on. So it's quite amazing a project called Bibi that I can talk about <laughs> a lot. But this, it's really nice. So this is uh, my final comment. And in a way, it, it uh, correlates to your PowerPoint with all these different approaches to climate change. This is a little story about five, five blind men who walk out to the world to find the nature, true, the, true na the truth nature of an elephant. And each, and they're blind, and each have a little part of the reality, but they see their world from their perspective. So that could be in a way engineers, sociologists, and so on and so on. We all have a part of the truth, but we need to collaborate together. So I was asked to put a final question, or do you want to, uh, the elephant? That's a really nice picture. <laughs> I always use it with my students. But uh, I'm very um, occupied by thinking about how can public authorities, because I, I uh, educate those, act as, and the word I used was because I was at a meeting with the Association of Municipalities. And they talked about, how they use this word scenographers. So when you make a theater play, there's scenographers, right? Yeah. So it's like, how can we as public authorities act as uh, scenographers? Because we, we affect the infrastructure, the garbage uh, systems, and so on and so on. And what does it mean for us that teaches the young generation? I know that in this room there are many planners, there are many students, there are many PhDs and so on. So we are all concerned with these issues about how do we cleverly collaborate in ways that, that, that makes it funny and that is solid and that, uh, yeah, that are democratic and so on. So, I'm very much concerned about what are the capabilities then that are needed in order to facilitate, convene, and so on, these arenas where we take part from different uh, sectors 
and have each their view on the elephant. So with this, I will close, and thank you. Thank you.